Today's guest on Captain Fred's Aviation Theater is Evelyn Bobby Trout. Bobby was born in Greenup, Illinois in January 1906. Her mother prayed for the first barn to be a girl, but she got a tomboy. Bobby was not like other little girls. Bobby is the only surviving member of the first transcontinental women's air race, which was held in 1929 and dubbed the Powder Puff Derby by Will Rogers. The race was from Santa Monica, California to the national air races in Cleveland, Ohio. Bobby flew with and against Amelia Earhart, Poncho Barnes, Louise Faden, Eleanor Smith, Marvel Crossan, and many others whose names are familiar in aviation. Bobby also broke and set numerous world records for endurance and non-stop refueling flights. She is a successful businesswoman. She invented and holds a patent for a rivet sorting machine. At age 91, she drives a red Porsche convertible and recently became the first woman to receive the Howard Hughes Aviation Award. Bobby Trout is a constant inspiration to women pilots and the 99s, which she helped found. Anna Camberos Province, 99 member at large, is pleased in cooperation with Captain Fred's Aviation Theater to present an exclusive personal interview with pioneer aviatrix, world record holder, and Charter 99 member, Evelyn Bobby Trout. And here comes our heroine now. Hi everybody. We are very pleased today to have with us Evelyn Bobby Trout. Those of you who are pilots or in aviation will recognize this famous name. Her name is Evelyn Trout, but everybody knows her as Bobby. And uh, Bobby, let's start off by asking, uh, how did you get the name Bobby? Would you tell our viewers? Be very glad to. I, I never did like the name Evelyn. So uh, one day uh, I went with the gang from our high school down to a swim at the YMS, uh, y YWCA in, mm -hmm. in L.A. And the girl was dishing out the towels had a boy's haircut. I couldn't wait to get home and go to the barber and get mine cut. But of course when I got home I, <laughs> I wasn't treated very, <laughs> very happily. <laughs> well, it was called a bob. You got your hair bobbed. Well, people would see my hair and they'd say, oh, Bobby, Bobby, you know. So you, you got a bob cut. Uh, so anyway, I accepted the name Bobby. You became Bobby became because Bobby. you got your hair bobbed. And then I had an E on the end of it, and I decided I might, why put an E on when just you can stop an I? So I've just left it with B-O-B-B-I. -B -B well, let's tell our viewers that uh, you lived in Chula Vista for a while. Yes, I did. I lived there with my grandmother for a while in 1921, and uh, graduated from grammar school there. Now, uh, did, you went to high school in Los Angeles. Yes, I, went, I had to take the uh, train down into L.A. and I had to transfer to go out to Lincoln High School in Los Angeles. So is this the one? Uh, we're not going to mention any names. Okay. But uh, the principal said that uh, you had to take uh, home economics. Yes. Because girls should learn how to cook and sew and type. So that, that's and, how uh, come I made the hamburger. So somebody broke the sewing machine, <laughs> and somebody broke the typewriter, Yes. and uh, the principal decided that he would let you take wood shop. That's right. So you did get to take wood shop, oh. and you were the only girl. In fact, I was uh, the only girl in all of the grammar schools uh, until I had to make that, that last one, you know. I was in the wood, woodcraft class all the time. 
They let me go in. I was being the only girl, but I loved it. I would be afraid to say no. <laughs> now, you finished high school, and um, you started at USC. I finished high school at Roosevelt. It was built in the meantime, so mm -hmm. I transferred to Roosevelt High School. I graduated from Roosevelt, and then, then I went over to USC, and I was going to be an architect. In fact, I was my uh, teacher's right-hand man in high school and was studying architecture. So when I went to USC, why well, that was the uh, college I was in. And uh, in, instead of going on, you opened a gas station. And, and um, well, that was before I went to college. Oh, and the name of the gas station was Radio Service. Because you had radios. That's right. And the customers uh, would come around and want or listen to the radio. That's right. And then they felt obligated. Uh, to buy their gas and get serviced there. That's right, exactly. So it wasn't long until they made me go back to school and Dad uh, quit work and uh, uh, then brother, my brother and I would help after school and on weekends. Uh, we're going to talk about you learning to fly and about the first woman's air race yes. when we come back from this very important announcement. Bobby, tell us how you went from being a girl gas station attendant to being a girl pilot. I made, I made a little money. In a year, anyway, I finally sold it, and I made enough there that uh, uh, I wasn't sure just what I wanted to do then. I went back to stay with mother in, uh, in L.A., and uh, finally I decided now is the time I had enough money, and now is the time I would go on down on Western, Southwestern, and uh, Popper Dad had a, a large field down there with about 15 hangars on it. It looked like a real, you know, business-like place. So I went in to see if uh, he would teach me uh, how to fly. Oh, yeah, sure he would. And I said, well, how much is a course? Well, the course would cost you $250. But after you're, after you're sold, then you have to pay for the time that it takes you to get your licenses. But all of this is in my book. All right, let's stop for a minute and show that book to our viewers. Uh, I'm holding Bobby's book, Just Plain, P-L-A-N-E, Crazy. Uh, this is uh, full of stories and photographs and newspaper clippings. Uh, I thought that I knew her story, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't know half of it. Uh, if you're really interested in knowing the whole story about Bobby Trout, uh, call the number that you see on your television screen for information about obtaining this book, Just Plain Crazy, and there's a videotape that she has out uh, with highlights of her career. If you're interested in either the book or the videotape, call the telephone number that you see on your screen. And now, Bobby, let's go on. You earned your pilot's license, and uh, you weren't content just to be a pilot. Almost immediately, you set out to, to break a world's record. On the 2nd of January, I took off in the dark and uh, stayed all day, and uh, came down at night after it was dark. And I spent 12 hours, 11 minutes, which was a, a big record for the women in those days. 12 so, hours and 11, 11 minutes. minutes. And, and I, that made you the world record holder. That's right. Mm -hmm. I guess most of my headlines around the world on that uh, flight. So your record was then broken by Eleanor Smith, and you had to go up a second time and set a new record. That's right. Tell us about so, that. So, uh, so uh, but, uh, Mr. Bone put the more gas uh, tanks in the plane, the same plane, an experimental job, and uh, I went up on uh, February the 9th, and I would went, I, I, we used the uh, miners field, and that's what is now the LAX. But we were on the south end of the field. There was a little building there about the size of a double garage out of corrugated metal. And it was from that field that I took off 
and it took off about four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, I believe it was, and uh, I stayed all night and came down the next morning around 10 or so. Anyway, I had set a record of 17 hours and 20 minutes. 17 hours and 20 minutes. I went to sleep a few times, too, and the <laughs> engine was speeding up, boy, it awakened me. So uh, you were again uh, the world record holder. That's right. And shortly after that, uh, the idea came up for a women's air race. Yes. Uh, it took place uh, from Santa Monica Airport uh -huh. to uh, Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. That's right. And uh, Amelia Earhart was flying uh, a Lockheed Vega. Right. And Louise Thaden was flying a Travel Air. A J5 Travel Air. And right. Poncho Barnes, what was her first she, name? She Florence? Was, Florence was flying Florence, a Travel Air. Poncho Barnes was flying a Travel Air. Uh, who else was in there? Uh, Marvell Crossan was uh, in the race? Marvell Crossan was in there. She was flying a, a sort of a plane that had sort of been rebuilt. I think part of it was a traveler, I believe, and a few other parts, but it was a mixture. And, and uh, uh, then there Claire Fay uh, was in the race? Claire Fay is the one who uh, found acid on her lines. Yeah. Well, there were 20 people in total. That's right. 20 women in the race. Took off. And uh, you took off? Uh, from Santa Monica, and the first day you flew to San Bernardino. That's right. Everything went fine the first day. Except with me. Ex oh, that's right. Uh, <laughs> you had compass and oil problems. Well, the first thing, the first thing when I got out and saw the plane that day that we would take off, we had to take it over to the compass rows to check the compass. Well, the compass was absolutely crazy. Well, we couldn't figure out what was wrong for a little bit. And finally, we figured out somebody had taken a piece of metal and bent it and put it on the uh, instrument panel. So uh, somebody had to look around and find a non-ferrous piece, I think it was a piece of wood, and uh, as, uh, put it on the uh, instrument panel, and we put the compass on that. Then we compensated the compass and everything there was all right. So uh, it had the oil change, too. So. Um, I was all ready to go when... And when you took off, you didn't have any oil pressure. When I took off and I was able to glance at the oil pressure gauge, it wasn't working. I thought, my land, do I have a broken oil line? What could be wrong with this, anyway? So I didn't go straight over to San Bernardino because I had to circle around L.A. in case the engine quit, and I had to have a place to land. So uh, I didn't win that first lap. And about halfway over to San Bernardino, Air, the, 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 the pressure gauge began to work. So I had a little airlock in the line. Okay, so you made it to San Bernardino. Yes. And the 20 of you parked your airplanes yes. and you spent the night there. And I saw the gas tanks run over with the gas before I went into the banquet. So you went into the banquet. You left a call, a wake-up call for the yes, next morning. Right. So you all went to sleep that night. And the next morning, they woke everybody up except... You and Thea. That's right. They, why? I don't know why, but they didn't awaken us until later. We got out the field just about the time they were ready to take off, and we had to find out what our new uh, course was because that night, you know, why they were moving around, where, where shall we go next? They had what? changed the course. Yes, they changed the course. But anyway, got everything all worked out, and uh, uh, we had to go down now. We had to go down and check in over at Imperial Airport and then turn for Yuma. <coughs> before we were supposed to go to Calexico. A few of the girls did go to Calexico. I don't know why, but maybe they didn't, uh, <coughs> didn't pay attention to that meeting that night. So you flew from uh, San Bernardino Checked to, over Imperial. to Imperial, El Centro, Imperial. Uh, and then went on to Yuma. And to Yuma. Now, the problem started that day. Oh, they, yes, they started that day. Um, Everybody seemed to have problems. The, the, first of all, uh, one of the gasoline tanks had dirt and sand in it. That was Thea Rash. Thea Rash had dirt and sand in yes. her gas tank. And uh, somebody had acid on their That was the one you talked struts. about. Ago, had the acid on the metal... Um, uh, Clara Fay, was that Clara, Clara Fay? Fay? Yeah, that's what she and her husband saw, and they both checked and said it was definitely acid. And uh, you lost a plane and a pilot that day. 
Marvell Cross. That was uh, that was after the landing at. Uh, well, at that was the, the next Yuma, day. No, no, no. Oh, it was no, after no, the landing this at Yuma. Just, uh, this was this was the second day of the race. That after she left Yuma, and was over around uh, the um, um, anyway, uh, uh, thick, uh, it was full of uh, cactus and you know and all that stuff. The yucca jungle. The, the yucca jungle. She uh, uh, had trouble of some kind and uh, cracked up and was killed. But uh, and apparently the plane just kind of broke up uh, because she went straight down. Uh, uh, something happened. Uh, the, uh, the parachute was partly opened and stuff. And of course, when you're raising, you're flying low. You can't use it. You can't use a chute. So what it was doing partly open, nobody knows. And they never even checked to find out what was wrong. Well, that brings up the question then. The word that comes to mind, Bobby, is uh, sabotage. Those well, that, things didn't happen by accident. That's what the papers thought it was. Because, uh, in fact, I was told by two different people they saw men out of, fooling around our planes that night at San Bernardino. So the route of the race was Santa Monica to San Bernardino to Yuma. Check over Imperial though, before we go to Yuma. Oh, check in over Imperial. Before we go to Yuma. To Yuma. And then to Phoenix. Yes. So the next day you made it on to Phoenix? The second day, the, yeah, the second day some of them made it on to Phoenix after they'd landed Yuma. And after they'd uh, gone then to Phoenix. But on the way to Phoenix is when Marvel Crossan was killed. That was on the way to Phoenix. That's right. Mm -hmm. Then uh, El Paso was next, and uh, Pecos, Texas Pecos was next, there. and something happened there with Poncho Barnes. Well, there was a girl. She, Poncho, of course, was flying. She wanted to win, too, but she saw a girl on the ground and knew that she needed help, so Poncho got out of the race. She had big heart of Poncho. It was terrific that way. Got, got out of the race and was set down to see if she could help the girl down on the ground. Well, she was more interested in helping uh, a fellow pilot That's right. uh, than winning the race. Okay, Kansas City, uh, apparently you stopped at St. Louis, yes. then uh, Cincinnati, Columbus, and the end of the race was at Cleveland. Cleveland, that's right. They're very air-minded in Cleveland. And you were... Um, considered to be out of the race because you had problems. Oh, yeah, surely. But so, I was there before two of the other girls. After all your trouble, you but, made it in before yes. two of the girls. And you know that uh, at Pecos, some automobile stuck out, had the nose stuck out on the runway too far, and uh, Pancho hit it with her wing, and that messed her plane up, and she wasn't able to go on. What a shame. Isn't that terrible? So all of you made it to Cleveland. Uh, and you passed up a couple of them and f finished what in, in horse racing you finished in the money yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, and but they divided it into two different groups that's right uh, the heavy plane mm -hmm. was won by Louise Faden and she was flying the uh, Lockheed uh, the travel air she was flying the travel air oh pardon me yes yeah, she Louise was flying, the, was flying the travel air mm -hmm. and then they divided it and they had a light plane, yeah. and you were flying in the light plane division. That's right. Uh, had you won, you would have won the light plane division. Correct. But uh, because of all the problems you had, um, I was, it was, I was won by... Um, uh, Phoebe Omley. Phoebe? Phoebe Omley. Omley. Phoebe Omley won the little one, because she knew her plane like the back of her hand. But you passed up two of them on the way. Uh, no, I, I bettered, uh, at the time, I bettered uh, eight minutes, I bettered Phoebe eight minutes from the time, uh, from the San Bernardino to checking in over the Imperial Airport. I didn't know that until the end of the race, but I would have, I could have won that race and nothing flat if I hadn't had two forced landings. But you were kind of like uh, the covered wagons going across uh, to California because you were blazing new trails. Nobody had ever done anything like this before. Oh, this was brand new. Uh, I want to mention something that our public may not know. Uh, I had always thought that the, the first women's transcontinental air race uh, was an activity of the 99s. Oh, But no. it wasn't. No. There, there was no 99s no. at that point. No. After the, the derby was over, um, you there and... A week uh, of races then at Cleveland. There, there was State. a Cleveland National Air Races. A week. 
and you and Amelia Earhart and, and a couple of the others mm -hmm. were under the bleachers at the uh, National Air Races in Cleveland. That's right. And after the race was over, uh, you decided that uh, it would be good to form a women's aviation group. That's right. Would you tell our viewers about that? Yes, we were just windjammering about the general activities of the races in the field, and all of a sudden we uh, almost decided it would be nice if the women could have an organization, the women flyers. So um, I piped up and said, well, now that means we have a lot of red tape to go through. Which have, you hate. Yes, which I don't like to sit down and do. And then there are the bylaws we have to work out, so we have a lot of work to do here. Well, Amelia was right close to me about where you are, and she said, Bobby, how would you like for us to do it back east? That I was said, her secretary. She had a secretary. Yes, she had a secretary. I said, that's wonderful. And the other girl said, yeah, that would be great. So I think um, Amelia and uh, probably uh, uh, Faye Wells and uh, uh, oh, I, maybe Ruth Nichols, but a number of the girls we get together every now and then back there evidently worked on them. So after uh, a couple months, uh, they uh, sent out letters, the bylaws and all, and a letter in there that if you'll sign the bylaws and put a dollar in here. One whole dollar. One whole dollar, you'll be a charter member of our new organization. Well, anyway, there were, they sent out to 117 licensed pilots then. Well, anyway, there were 99 who sent their dollars in and signed the bylaws. So uh, at the first meeting, which was held on Long Island, there were about 40 or 50 girls went to that meeting. And Amelia was there, and she stood up, I think, and said, well, since there have been 99 uh, charter members, uh, why don't we call it the 99s? And everybody decided that would be a good name, so that's what it wound up with, the so, 99s. So you were uh, one of the uh, creators and a charter member of the 99s. That's right. Would it be fair to say that you gave birth <laughs> under the bleachers at the Cleveland National Air Races to the 99s? I think that's very good. I wanted to tell you what happened with Eleanor Smith and her. Uh, you were rivals. You were competitors. Oh, yes. uh, you set a record, then she broke your record, then you broke her record. But uh, in the end, the two of you got together and you set a new world's record. Would yeah. you tell our viewers about that? Well, anyway, about 49 hours, our first flight. Our first refueling. Three days? For, first, yeah. uh, two days and two nights. Our first refueling flight for women in the world. Wow. Bobby, at the beginning of the program, I mentioned that pilots and people in aviation would recognize the famous name of Bobby Trout. I also want to point out that Bobby is a, a natural resource because at age 90, she's one of the few remaining pioneers that we can have the privilege of visiting with and learning firsthand knowledge about the early days of aviation, uh, the Powder Puff Derby, the 99s, and so on. So we're both honored and privileged to have someone of her stature with us today. Thank you very much, Bobby. Thank you. As always, this is Captain Fred saying, I love airplanes and I honor the people who fly them.